Welcome to the Global Migration Centre Lecture Series Podcasts. This is the recording of the International Conference, A Passport for Refugees, Past, Present and Future Issues. The conference is in partnership with the Fondation Albert Cohen. If you wish to keep informed about our activities, check out our website on graduateinstitute.ch slash gmc or connect with us on Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. Good afternoon, everyone, dear ladies, gentlemen, colleagues, friends, and students. I'm very pleased to welcome you at this international conference entitled Passport for Refugees, Past, Present, and Future Issues. Uh, unfortunately, the director of the Grad Institute, uh, Marie-Laure Salle, is unfortunately unable to join us uh, today because of uh, a last-minute commitment. I'm uh, Vincent Chetay, professor of international law at the Graduate Institute and Director of the Global Migration Center here at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies. Uh, this conference um, is uh, co-organized co by the Fondation Mémoire Albert Cohen and the Global Migration Center. Uh, and this conference is in fact the result of a long journey and many discussions uh, between the center, the foundation, Uh, several years ago, uh, uh, Lionel Aracil and Max Manu from the foundation came uh, to my office to discuss and propose some joint uh, activities in relation to the role of Albert Cohen in uh, establishing the, the refugee travel uh, document. And uh, uh, Albert Cohen worked for uh, the ancestor of the UN Refugee Agency after the Second World War. And he played a critical role in uh, 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 the drafting of le the London Agreement of 1946 uh, relating to the refugee travel document. Uh, however, uh, and it was also the, the subject of discussions among us, uh, however, uh, Albert Cohen did not create the certificate as such because uh, before him, uh, uh, Fridtjof Nansen Uh, 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 did uh, uh, establish in 1922 the Refugee uh, uh, Travel Certificate, also well known as a Nansen Passport. And uh, uh, while discussing this uh, fascinating history of the Refugee Travel Document, we decided to organize uh, uh, an international conference to take stock about the past, current, and future issues uh, surrounding the, the refugee travel document. So uh, accordingly, the conference will discuss and assess the manifold challenges uh, related to the travel refugee document. Uh, the refugee travel document, or Nansen passport is in fact frequently neglected by uh, scholars and practitioners, yet it has a central role to play today. And thinking about uh, the potential uh, of the refugee uh, travel document is particularly important today, especially uh, because this is a year of several uh, celebrations, uh, 70 years after the adoption of the Geneva Convention relating to the status of refugees, and 75 years after uh, the adoption of the London Agreement uh, 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 involving uh, uh, Albert Cohen. The, the refugee travel document is, uh, uh, in fact, the founding act of the current international regime of, of refugee protection. It is indeed uh, the very first tool and instrument adopted in 1922 by states uh, at the international level within the, the framework of the League of Nations. And I'm very pleased uh, today to uh, uh, remind us this uh, uh, history and also the contemporary challenges. I'm very pleased to, uh, today to welcome uh, Guy Goodwin-Gill. Guy Goodwin-Gill is a well-known and internationally recognized authority in the field of uh, international refugee law. He is uh, online from uh, 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 Australia. Uh, he is a professor uh, of law at the University of New South Wales in Australia and also at the Calder Center for International Refugee Law. 
He's also Emeritus Fellow at uh, Oxford uh, and uh, Emeritus Professor of International Refugee Law at the University of o Oxford. He, he has published a lot of reference books, uh, uh, and more recently, the new edition of the Refugee in International Law, uh, 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 an authoritative book on uh, international refugee law. Uh, so uh, I'm very pleased uh, to give the floor to Guy uh, Goodwin-Gill uh, to share uh, his views about uh, the refugee travel document. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Vincent, for the introduction. I'm particularly pleased to uh, come back to the question of passports, which first attracted my attention uh, back in 1969 when I began my research into, uh, into, into international law and the movement of persons between states. The passport as an act of state is what interests me in particular, an act of state which can open doors in many countries, or it can lead to the gallows, as someone called William Joyce discovered in 1946. But for refugees, Passports are especially important. In the aftermath of the First World War, proving who you were suddenly became an issue, and one of direct concern for stateless persons in this place. The passport had already entrenched itself in border control practices, and a series of international conferences held between 1920 and 1926 agreed on the style and format which remains largely unchanged to this day. Well, unchanged if you disregard the advent of the machine-readable document, the ever-increasing importance of biometrics. Problems with regard to passports and documentation for refugees had already been raised during the first meetings of the Council of the League of Nations. The notion of the right of everyone to recognition as a person before the law would have to wait for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But the protection dimensions were already recognised in the statement of Dr. Benish, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czechoslovak Republic, as tied to the definition of the legal status of the refugee. If unilateral action were in fact capable of resolving the international protection dimensions in connection with passports, he said still further complications were likely as soon as the question of interstate travel arose. And this would be all the more likely if efforts to find employment were successful. In his view, the League should aim to solve all such legal questions subject to agreement of the various governments, which should include facilitating employment by affording greater facilities in connection with passports, identity cards and movement generally, and by making these documents valid in all countries. Now, the modern story of the refugee passport began at a meeting in Paris in February 1921. In a story I've told and retold many times before, Gustave Ador, then President of the International Committee of the Red Cross, met with the President of the Council of League of Nations and brought up the urgent problem of up to one and a half million Russian refugees then adrift. Adrift without protection, written off by their country of origin, with no prospect of settling locally, of finding employment, let alone of moving on to other countries. Nor were they the only ones. Something had to be done. Something had to be done with regard to legal status, employment, and emigration. And there was no better organization than the League, than the League argued the ICRC, to look into the issues. And only the League was in a position to surmount the political and social difficulties and come up with solutions. On the 15th of June, 1921, Gustav Ador wrote again, urging the League to take the necessary action. The Secretary General, Sir Eric Drummond, sounded out governments and many responded positively, favouring someone with personal authority, able to secure the necessary support from governments to influence non-governmental organisations and gain their respect. In short, a High Commissioner. A conference in August adopted a number of recommendations and invited Friedhof Nansen to take on the role of High Commissioner for Russian Refugees. And this conference in August 1921 noted that special papers were needed to facilitate the movement of refugees, that the government should adopt a common attitude to enable travel, that any papers issued by the High Commissioner should be recognised as provisionally valid, and that states should consider temporary relaxation of immigration restrictions for refugees. 
The High Commissioner's mandate looked fairly straightforward at the time. He was to define the legal status of refugees, to organize their repatriation or allocation to other states, to find them productive employment, and together with private voluntary organizations, to provide for their relief. With these considerations in mind, Nansen prepared a special report. Specifically, he asked for assistance in regard to identity papers, the lack of which was a major problem preventing travel by refugees to countries where the cost of living might be less or the possibilities of employment greater. There were two solutions, he suggested. First, the issue of special emergency certificates of identity by the governments of countries where the refugees found themselves. Second, the issue of a special identity certificate by the High Commissioner himself. Nansen opted for the first solution, which had greater practical advantages and accorded more with the wishes of governments. He therefore proposed a sample certificate, urging governments to issue them to those who asked for them, to visa the certificates issued by other governments just as they would an ordinary passport, and to do so without charge. Visas were especially vital for refugees in Constantinople. Here, costs of visas were being paid by the High Commissioner's office, which was a somewhat odd given the common interest in solving the problem. He hoped, Nansen hoped, that they could be issued free of charge. Transit visas also needed attention, and again he urged their prompt and free grant to any refugee who had a visa for elsewhere. Since such visas would be issued only on the responsibility of the High Commissioner's representatives, there had been no serious risks for governments. Following the Geneva Conference of July 1922, 16 states unanimously agreed on the arrangement with regard to the issue of certificates of identity to Russian refugees and recommended for adoption by League members and non-members. However, there were still obstacles to be overcome and the certificate was subject to certain conditions. It would be accepted for visa entry and transit purposes, it would be issued in at least two languages, one of them being French, as recommended by the Paris Conference on Passports of 1920, but it would be issued gratis only to destitute persons, and in particular, it did not imply a right of return to the issuing state without special authorization of that state. So it was only a beginning, and there was much that remained to, to be done. In particular, the next steps that had to be achieved were the extension of the arrangement to cover other groups of refugees. This first one was limited to Russian refugees. And so in 1924, an extension to Armenia refugees was agreed. No conference was required. And in 1926, finally, the right of return to the issuing state was accepted. In 1922, the British government had informed the League that it was prepared to grant passports and transport facilities for unemployed Russian refugees and to agree to provide visas and identity certificates free of charge in the expectation that other governments would do the same. The High Commission reported on identity certificates for Armenian refugees in 1924, was pleased to note that governments generally were in favour of such an extension without the need, as I mentioned, for a further conference. The 1926 arrangement identified the beneficiaries of the identity certificate provided and provided for the return of refugees to countries from which they emigrate. It also provided for free issue of certificates and visas to indigent refugees, provided for the general application of the identity certificate system, and the creation, interestingly, of a revolving fund by means of the issue by the High Commissioner of stamps to the value of five gold francs. These would be purchased yearly by every self-supporting refugee in return for the issue of such an identity certificate. How did these stamps work? The revolving fund provided much assistance to refugees and also to governments bearing the cost of refugees. Here's a certificate issued in Vienna on the 7th of July, 1928. It's valid for one year. It's not valid for return to the homeland. Indeed, it's invalidated if the holder, Alexander Borodin, does return. He'd been born in Archangel in 1904. In addition to the Austrian stamp, 
one and a half shillings. It carries the Nansen stamp, 1928, five gold francs. And it states it is issued further to the 1922 arrangement. Next, we see samples from Norway. The form may be different, but again, we have the stamps. The stamp with Nansen's portrait on it, Geneva Resolution of 12th of May 1926, and the ILO is now also responsible. The cost, five gold francs. A second stamp, similar, for renewal in 1931. Again from Norway, two more. Times move on, 1938, Nansen is still in the picture on the left-hand side of the page, but 1939, there's a change. Things are getting a little less elaborate, a little cheaper, more practical. The Nansen office is involved. The refugié Rus is protected. There was, in fact, little standardization in the issue of travel documents. This one is from France. It's the Certificate d'identité of Marc Chagall. It was issued in January 1929, much used, much abused. It was renewed to 1931 and to 1933. It too is valid unless the bearer returns to Russia. D'origine russe n'ayant acquis aucune autre nationalité, it says. His profession, artiste, peintre, is living in Boulogne sur Seine. In 1933, the situation worsened. The Nansen office itself was proposed for liquidation. It was subsequently saved for nearly 10 years. But they looked. There was look, the International Advisory Council looked for a future which would be more secure and a convention to replace the arrangements and recommendations. In 1933, in 1933, the International Nansen Office for Refugees issued a report which had been prepared by the Intergovernmental Advisory Committee and contained a proposal for a new convention. Various recommendations included one on expulsion which recommended against it because of the difficulty of obtaining permission to enter a neighboring country. And there was one recommendation on re-entry. And again, it recommended that re-entry be subject to no further authorization for the curtailment of this right of re-entry, hindered movement of refugees and harmed international relations. And so the 1933 convention was agreed. It was not widely ratified but it look, took the refugee travel document one step further on. In fact, Article 2 obliges contracting states to issue a Nansen certificate to refugees lawfully resident. Chacune des parties contractantes s'engage à délivrer des certificats Nansen valables pour un an au moins aux réfugiés résidant régulièrement sur son territoire. It consolidated the principle of return and thus also the principle of freedom of movement. Let's step away from the formality of law and treaty to consider the very practical value of the Nansen passport and the contribution to individual self-worth. Let's take the case of George Novosiltsev. Here we have a 1960s certified copy of an extract from the Acte Annexe au Mariage. Georges Novoselsef married Miss McKenna on the 4th of February, 1939. This certificate confirms that he is the subject of a birth certificate issued in accordance with the June 1928 agreement. It confirms that the Office des Refugiés Russes confirms in turn that he is a Russian refugee who has not acquired another nationality. It confirms further that he was born in 1907 in Rostov-sur-Don, and that the certificate's confirmation was issued by the High Commissioner for Refugees, all of whose signatures were illegible on the 26th of January 1939. So what happened next? France issued Georges with a Nansen passport. It bears his photo and his signature. It is valid for the UK. Remember his wife, Mrs. McKenna, is he's going to visit his wife's family, he hopes. It will cease to be valid if he enters the USSR. 
excuse me, it is valid from 29th of November 1946 until the 28th of November 1947, unless renewed, and it was issued in Paris. Of course, like every identity document or travel document before the machine readable area, it contains personal details. He is an electrical engineer. He lives at 190 Rue de la Convention in Paris. That's in the 15th arrondissement, I think, not far from Metro Convention. He's tall. He's 1 meter 82. He has brown hair, but the cigarette doesn't say much about his appearance generally, about his eyes, his nose, his mouth, his beard, his chin, his visage. It was enough for those days, however. The document is renewed from 6th of June 1950 to 5th of June 1951. Before that, he asks for a, and obtains a visa aller et retour for a visit to England sometime in 1946-1947. And in June 1950, he applies for and receives a visa to visit the UK within the next three months. Price 16 shillings. And so he goes traveling via Dieppe, landing in New Haven on the 2nd of August, 1950, he's given permission to remain for one month. He probably reports to the police on the 4th of August, 1950. It's a month apparently well spent. On the 1st of September, 1950, he leaves from New Haven on the night ferry, arriving back in France in Dieppe on the following day, 2nd of September, 1950. A Russian refugee, an original national passport. Let's go back, though, for a moment to 1935 and start again. In 1935, the Intergovernmental Advisory Commission had noted the worsening situation for refugees. There was a need for resettlement opportunities. Expulsion was still a problem. It recommended that the expulsion be limited to situations in which the individual was a menace to public order and security. And it would recommend further that states refrain from withdrawing national certificates. It went on to recommend the adoption of a standard type for national passports to avoid confusion and the difficulties which arose. The Nansen office was recommended to devise a model and to refer to the 1920 conference on passports, which had been held in Paris in 1920. In 1943, the League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, Herbert Emerson, reported to council and members of the League. He looked ahead to the post-war situation. There would be some temporary problems, he anticipated, while others would be unable or unwilling to return owing to lack of protection, especially the victims of racial and religious persecution. In 1943, the Intergovernmental Commission on Refugees, which had been set up at Avion in 1938, decided to expand its mandate and to take under its protection all those who might be forced to leave or unable to remain in their countries because of the danger to their lives or liberties on account of their race, religion or political beliefs. Which brings us to the work of Albert Cohen. As we've heard, he was a member of the IGCR. In 1944, the IGCR resolved to ask a commission of experts to examine the feasibility of adopting an internationally recognized identity and travel document for status persons and persons not enjoying the protection of any government. In due course, a preliminary draft arrangement was prepared, a specimen identity and travel document and commentary were produced and submitted to the experts who did their work and at the end of the month reported to the IGCR. In October 1946, the delegates of 15 governments represented, were represented in an international conference in London, convened by the director of the IGCR. The agreement was signed on the final day. It entered into force in January 1947, signed by 23, ratified by 21 states. It closely resembles the national passport in its travel document provisions. It states that the holder is the concern of the IGCR. It's without prejudice to status, especially nationality. 
the holder is authorized to return and responsibility may be transferred. It's valid for one or two years and it's recommended to be valid for as many countries as possible. All contracting states undertook to recognize and to accept responsibility if it was transferred. Indeed, the outline and the model were duly incorporated in Article 28 of the 1951 Convention on Refugees. But Article 37 provides that though without prejudice to Article 28 too, the Convention replaces as between the parties the earlier arrangements and conventions of the 20s and 30s and the London Agreement itself. Both the Ad Hoc Committee and the 1951 Conference counseled against deviating the London model. Recommendation A of the final act of convention, moreover, urges government parties to London or which recognize London travel documents to continue to issue them. Extend their, such documents to, to convention refugees until such time as they shall have assumed obligations under Article 28. Article 28 itself is interesting. Paragraph one provides Article 1 provides that the contracting states shall issue to refugees lawfully in their territory travel documents for the purposes of travel outside, unless compelling reasons of national security or public order otherwise require. And the provisions of the schedule to this document, to this convention, should apply with respect to such documents. That provision was not in the London Convention, that's why I say it was more generous. One second. Now this 1928, the Article 28 Convention travel document has been a model, of course, and in uh, it's been a model for Europe as well, and has been a model for every state that has ratified the 1951 Convention ever since. In 1952, the Council of Europe looked at the possibility of a European passport for refugees. It was raised in the legal committee. Research found that the London travel document was being issued by the contracting parties to all lawfully staying refugees covered by the IRO. The pre-World War II refugees were still being issued with Nansen passports by Belgium, France, Greece, Switzerland, and the UK. Two years later, three years later, the legal committee recommended standardization of travel documents. London and Nansen often differed. It recommended adoption of the CTD and model and the model devised by UNHCR so as to be uniform and easily recognizable by consular and immigration officials. The Consultative Assembly accepted and recommended the states not party to the CSR 51 accede to London or applied in practice. And UNHCR devised a model which was for many years the standard. It was copied by states, it was issued by UNHCR at its own expense to states unable to meet the costs of production themselves. It's now been replaced by a model that's machine readable. Coming up to today, what are we looking for in a refugee passport? We're most concerned with refugees, freedom of movement and protection. First of all, we need to know who issues refugee documentation. Well, UNHCR issues refugee documentation daily in its task of providing protection and assistance and determining refugee status. It issues already, in many cases, biometric refugee cards for this purpose. When it comes to travel documentation, why should, a, why should not a refugee card issued by UNHCR suffice? In fact, it does and it doesn't. States themselves issue convention travel documents to refugees whom they have recognized. And that is the situation, that situation contains, continues to this day. What should the refugee documentation do? It must, so far as possible, identify the person concerned. And with biometrics, that's increasingly relevant. It must also certify that he or she is a refugee. And, I suggest, require or request or call for that person's protection as a refugee. What ought refugee documentation to do? 
it must conform to international standards, which are the standards generated by ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. It needs to be machine reason readable, and it needs to reflect biometric requirements as well. It must be internationally recognized. It must be accepted for visa purposes. It must be accepted, in fact, for the purposes of international travel, employment, education, family reunion, resettlement, all of them valid reasons why refugees should move. It must be accepted as evidence of refugee status and entitlement to protection. It must be accepted for return to the country of issue. So we've come some way indeed since 1922. The refugee is entitled to refugee documentation to a conventional travel document. But does it get the refugee where he or she needs to go? There are still serious limitations on the refugees' freedom of movement today. And that is going to be the next challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Guy goodwin Gill, for your very uh, uh, interesting presentation and his immersion in uh, the long uh, history of the refugee uh, travel uh, document. Uh, because uh, clearly, as you rightly uh, uh, highlighted, the, the long history and origin of the Nansen passport does echo to the development of the international uh, regime of refugee protection. Uh, and uh, uh, it was, of course, the starting point of uh, the Phonic Act, the very first uh, tool, and then uh, 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 creating a, a momentum to develop further the legal status of uh, refugees. Uh, I would like to, to continue uh, this discussion with uh, 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 a presentation on uh, um, the, the, the current uh, potential uh, of the Nansen, uh, of a Nansen passport for uh, the 21st century, uh, because clearly uh, there is a long history, but also uh, the potential of these instruments is uh, too frequently uh, neglected. Uh, the history has already uh, been uh, 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 highlighted before. Let's uh, 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 start with the legal basis, the contemporary legal basis, uh, as uh, mentioned by uh, Guy Godwin Gill, the, the, uh, the, the key uh, and the, the, the key source of legal commitment is the Refugee Convention relating to the status of refugees, adopted in 1951 and amended by the New York Protocol. And uh, this uh, uh, convention it does uh, regulate uh, in a quite uh, uh, detailed manner uh, the travel, the refugee travel document, also called the convention, uh, convention travel document, CTD. Uh, it is first governed by Article 28 regarding the conditions of eligibility and then further detail in the uh, schedule at the end of the Refugee Convention, and also with a specimen of this travel document in uh, Annex. And clearly, this uh, uh, instrument is the most important one simply because still today this is the primary universal instrument of refugee protection, and it is also uh, uh, ratified by a, a broad number of states, uh, 148 state parties to the Refugee Convention, so uh, this is uh, a rather good score in terms of ratification, uh, 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 covering many different uh, continents uh, and uh, regions. So, uh, uh, but of, this is not this is the, the, the primary source, but not the only one. In the sense that uh, the the refugee uh, travel document has been also uh, restated and reinforced in uh, several other uh, binding conventions. Uh, uh, including, for instance, the convention relating to the status of stateless persons in 1954 uh, 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 at the universal level. And at the regional level, uh, it is important also to acknowledge the convention governing the specific aspects of refugee problems in Africa, uh, restating and reinforcing the uh, cardinal importance and the binding nature for state parties uh, of the travel uh, document. So, in short, 
Uh, so, so the legal basis today is well established, uh, and uh, the travel document uh, is uh, uh, firmly grounded on uh, international uh, uh, law. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, its scope and uh, content meaning must be further specified in order to better grasp the potential and continuing relevance of the convention uh, travel document. So what is it and what is not is important to address in order to better understand its uh, potential for uh, uh, current refugees and uh, future ones uh, uh, as uh, uh, it may uh, happen in many regions in the world. Uh, it is uh, the um, troubles in Afghanistan is only one example among others of uh, uh, the, the future uh, uh, refugees uh, uh, who can uh, uh, for, for whom this document uh, is uh, extremely important. So first of all, what is uh, this uh, uh, a convention travel document? This is uh, this document is issued by the state of asylum. Uh, uh, in which refugees are lawfully, uh, lawfully staying. Uh, uh, this is, uh, re I mean, the, the requirement under Article 28 of the Refugee Convention. So this is similar, but still different from a passport in the sense that it is adopted, it is uh, 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 established not by the country of nationality like a passport, but by the country of residence, uh, uh, state parties to the Refugee Convention, and uh, in short, the country of asylum. Uh, this document is issued for the only purpose of travel outside uh, the territory of the state of asylum. So this is here also important to clarify the scope of this travel document, because uh, here there are two important differences when compared to uh, national passport. First of all, it does not determine or affect the status and nationality of its holders, so this is uh, uh, no more, but uh, uh, not less that a travel document. Nothing regarding the proof of nationality like a national passport. And it does not entitle the holder to the diplomatic protection of the country of asylum. So this is uh, uh, well established by the schedule at the end of the refugee uh, convention. Importantly, uh, 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 and also, uh, unfortunately, uh, for uh, many uh, refugees, to, because this travel document has nothing to say about admission. Uh, this travel document does not create right of entry into the territory of other state parties to the Geneva Convention. Again, under Article 28 of the Refugee Convention. Which means that uh, 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 refugees uh, still need to apply for a visa when this is requ required. So clearly, this is a travel document uh, without prejudice to uh, admission in other states. However, there are uh, uh, exceptions, uh, uh, and there are two types of exception. There is a, a general exception uh, based on regional free movement agreement. So, uh, 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 because even if refugees are not explicitly mentioned in a regional free movement agreement, uh, uh, lawful refugees are uh, uh, protected and covered by a, a regional free movement agreement. So, which this means that uh, the Refugee Convention does establish a travel document, and when uh, uh, combined with free movement agreement, the, the refugees has the right to enter in uh, the uh, following the, 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 the relevant provisions of the said agreement. So, of course, the European Union is a well-known example, but uh, contrary to the common uh, European-centric approach to free movement, in reality, many other continents across the world uh, uh, have uh, also their own free movement uh, agreement, Africa is a particularly rich uh, continent. Uh, it has adopted uh, 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 recently uh, uh, a free movement agreement uh, by the African Union, not yet uh, uh, into force, uh, but uh, 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 once the number of ratification will be 
uh, met, it will be the most important uh, free movement agreement in the world in terms of uh, the number of benefici beneficiaries and so on. And, this, and also at the sub uh, regional level, there are many uh, free movement agreements in Africa. Uh, of course, ECOWAS is a well-known example, but COMESA, ERC are also, uh, 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 also organizing free movement uh, agreements. Uh, and uh, besides Africa, uh, in uh, the uh, Caribbean region, CARICOM is a good example, but also Mercosur. So clearly, uh, the refugee travel document does not create a right of entry, but such a right of entry may still be guaranteed through other uh, instrument, binding instrument, regional free movement agreements, but there is also uh, another, uh, uh, a second exception, refugee-specific visa exemption treaties. So uh, the most uh, uh, well-known is the European Agreement of 1979, adopted within the Council of Europe. So according to this agreement, uh, refugees are exempted from the requirement of a visa uh, uh, to travel across uh, the territory of state parties. And there are also many bilateral or tripartite uh, agreements uh, 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 establishing an exemption of visa for uh, refugees. I put here, because we are in Switzerland, I put here, uh, 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 and the Bern Agreement of 1964, but there are many other similar agreements establishing an exemption of visa for uh, uh, recognized refugees uh, uh, among uh, state parties. So this agreement is between uh, Benelux countries, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg, and uh, Switzerland, and it, it is still today in force uh, 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 as such. So. Uh, no right of entry, but several exceptions. Most importantly, and it has been mentioned by uh, Guy Goodwin-Gill, uh, because initially, uh, initially there was no right to return in the country of asylum. Uh, and uh, uh, with the London Agreement and more recently the Refugee Convention, there is a right to be uh, readmitted. So it means that uh, the travel document does establish a right to be admitted in the country of asylum. So uh, the travel document does entitle to, uh, to leave the country of asylum uh, and then to return uh, regularly in accordance with uh, the Refugee Convention. Uh, uh, and this is especially recognized in the schedule of the, the Refugee uh, Convention. So clearly, uh, 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 and despite its rather uh, uh, technical uh, uh, nature, the, uh, the, the travel document uh, also fulfill a, a crucial uh, function. So uh, let's uh, say a few words about the function and rationale of the convention uh, travel document. Uh, because the, this travel document is much more than uh, just a travel document. Uh, Article 28 uh, does not only bond state parties to issue travel documents, but more importantly, uh, Article 28 does oblige to recognize the refugee uh, uh, travel document issued by other parties. So uh, this is an acknowledgement, a commitment towards a mobility of refugees between state parties. Uh, and, uh, and this is a very important function which is particularly relevant today uh, also. Huh? Uh, and this commitment towards uh, mobility of refugees is uh, uh, also reinforced through the principle of mutual recognition. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is not only an obligation to issue travel documents, but to recognize travel documents issued by other state parties. So, uh, uh, and here again, this is another uh, uh, a typical example of the continuing relevance of the travel document uh, today. Uh, but of course, when compared to 1951, the, the normative context is quite uh, also different in the sense that uh, the, the refugee travel document is, uh, uh, was clearly of course, uh, a, a pioneer in 1951, but today it is part of a broader normative environment uh, also related to human rights law, because it is clearly related to the right to leave any country 
and to return to his country as acknowledged by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but also by the uh, ICCPR, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And by the way, all state parties to the Refugee Convention have uh, ratified the ICCPR. So clearly here, uh, there is a, a mutually reinforcing regime between refugee law and human rights law. And from this angle, the, the, the refugee travel document is a specification of the broader right to leave uh, any country and to return one's own country. This is a practical means to implement the human rights to leave and to return. And uh, uh, the right to live and to return is acknowledged uh, in uh, the ICCPR and, in fact, in many other uh, treaties. Uh, I put this one because this is the most well ratified and universal convention. And, and, and clearly, also, the right to live and, uh, and to return is part of customary international law. I will not develop too much. Uh, tease. Uh, I, I wrote a long uh, chapter in my last book about teas, and I will not bother you about. Uh, but clearly, uh, uh, the right to live and to return is uh, universally binding for uh, every uh, uh, UN member state, uh, whether through uh, ratified treaties, such as uh, Refugee Convention, ICCPR, or through uh, uh, the international uh, custom. So, uh, uh, an important uh, function still uh, uh, today. Let's uh, continue with uh, uh, what should be uh, and could be a refugee passport for uh, the 21st century. Uh, uh, Guy Godwin Gill, all uh, before me, also uh, uh, presented a, a picture of what should be uh, uh, the key element of, of, of this. Uh, my, the purpose of my presentation here is, uh, uh, first of all, to restate the continuing importance of the conventional travel document, in the sense that uh, the Refugee Convention is still today the starting point uh, uh, to uh, imagine or design uh, 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 a broader refugee passport. Uh, and because uh, uh, this, uh, 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 and this continuing importance is highlighted by two uh, major uh, elements. First of all, uh, this is a tool of mobility because under Article uh, 28, there is no requirement of a specific purpose to, uh, to obtain the travel document. This means that uh, uh, the practical significance of travel document as a tool of mobility is extremely important and it can be used in a broad variety of situations. So uh, family reunification, uh, education, employment, medical care, and so on. Uh, again, because there is no uh, requirement about the purpose, uh, the duration of the travel abroad uh, under uh, the Refugee uh, Convention. So this is a crucial tool uh, of mobility. But not only, uh, the, the, the refugee travel document is also uh, an important tool of refugee protection in itself, because uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, I mean, once a refugee has the travel document, it gives access to durable solution, uh, and generally through resettlement. In, in this sense, the, uh, and in fact, I mean, uh, this was the primary objective of the drafters of the Refugee Convention. Uh, during the drafting history of the Refugee Convention, uh, the state representative, and especially uh, the, the delegation of, of the UK, were very clear about the role and function of Article 28. Article 28 were bound to be used in order to, as a facilitator of resettlement. So, and here again, uh, uh, as it was the case in 1951, still today, resettlement is a key issue uh, to protect uh, refugees. So clearly, there is here a continuing relevance of the refugee travel document uh, uh, still today, and clearly thinking about what should be refugee pa passport should start with uh, 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 this uh, document in order to explore all, uh, 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 to explore its uh, potential. And it's, uh, 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 these two elements 
uh, as a, a tool for mobility and for resettlement were uh, not only acknowledged in 1951, but uh, they are still today uh, extremely uh, they are crucial for many refugees uh, in the world. And uh, T's continuing relevance is also well exemplified by the, the Global Compact on Refugees, uh, uh, the um, UN General Assembly adopted in December uh, uh, 28 uh, the Global Compact on Refugees after two years of um, extensive consultations led by uh, UNHCR and uh, with uh, member states, uh, international organizations, civil society. And here, we can also see uh, the interface between the travel document as designed in 1951 and uh, this new uh, uh, compact uh, on refugees. Uh, maybe a few words about the rationale of this compact. So the Global Compact on Refugees is a framework for a more predictable and equitable responsibility sharing. So, uh, 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 and responsibility sharing is uh, the core content of these, and it can be achieved through resettlement. So clearly, uh, uh, there is here an important uh, interaction between the two. Uh, I must add, however, that the global compact, the refugee compact, is not legally binding. Uh, it, is, uh, it represents the political will and ambition of the international community as a whole. So it is not legally binding, but still it is oper operationalized through voluntary contribution uh, of states to achieve uh, the collective uh, outcomes uh, uh, detailed in the, the Refugee Compact. And what is interesting here is that the, the primary, the, the raison d'etre of the, the Refugee Compact is to facilitate access to durable solutions. So here again, uh, there is an important interaction. Uh, more generally, the, the Refugee Compact has four key objectives, and at least the three first objectives are uh, uh, particularly relevant uh, when it comes to the travel, refugee com uh, 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 the travel um, document under the Refugee Convention. To ease the pressure on us countries, enhance refugee self-reliance, expand access to third country solutions. So clear, here again, we can uh, see uh, uh, the potential of the refugee uh, uh, doc uh, travel document, uh, uh, mainly through a resettlement in order to ease the pressure of those countries, because contrary to the common belief of many politicians and mass media, uh, uh, 90% of refugees in the world are hosted in the global south. There is no invasion of the global north. Uh, 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 all, uh, the vast majority of refugees are in the global south, and there is more than ever a need that the global north is uh, taking its share, because today responsibility sharing means more resettlement in the global north, not the contrary, because the global south has already the vast majority of refugees in the world. And clearly here we can see the interest of the travel document in order to alleviate the pressure on, uh, on, 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 uh, on countries and also to ensure self-reliance of refugees, because it's true that for refugees living uh, in uh, Iran, Lebanon, or Jordan, Clearly, uh, the travel document and the possibility to find an employment abroad is a key strategy to enhance their self-reliance -rel instead of continuing uh, uh, of staying in uh, uh, refugee camps without any uh, other prospect, uh, uh, perspective of a durable solution. So clearly, uh, 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 the travel document is still at the heart, the very heart of the refugee, international refugee regime, and it has the potential to be implemented in uh, a mutually reinforcing way with the Refugee Compact. I mean, uh, uh, when you look at the content of the Refugee Compact, resettlement is a central issue. Uh, I, I put here some, uh, some extracts of the, the, the Global Compact. So uh, uh, resettlement is uh, acknowledged as a central tool for burden and responsibility sharing, but the compact also does acknowledge 
uh, at the same time that only a limited number of countries are using resettlement. So clearly, there is a need for a more systematic use of a resettlement uh, in order, uh, uh, as proposed by the Global Compact, and uh, through some voluntary contributions. Interestingly, the travel uh, uh, document is also mentioned in the footnote 47, uh, a single voyage convention travel document, uh, 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 not only in the context of resettlement, but also in the context of emergency evacuation. So uh, to take a, a, an easy example, uh, emergency evacuation uh, in Afghanistan and many other countries, this can play a role, but of course, uh, beyond uh, this kind of emergency evacuation, uh, the more formalized process of resettlement is probably the more clear-cut avenue to, uh, for further development. Uh, in addition to resettlement, uh, the other central component of the refugee compact, which is particularly relevant in the context of refugee travel document, is uh, related to complementary pathways for admission to third countries. So, and here again, you can see uh, 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 how the refugee compact does echo to the two functions I mentioned before of the travel document. As a tool of mobility, which is today called complementary pathway because mobility is not a nice word for states, so it is always better to rephrase it as complementary pathway and uh, 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 as a tool for durable solutions through resettlement. So clearly, even if this is not always obvious, huh, uh, to, to be clear, because uh, travel documents are only mentioned uh, in passing, there are still a key role to play in implementing the uh, global compact. Uh, and, uh, 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 and for its uh, future development. So let's uh, add a few uh, remarks about the way forward, to forward a refugee passport, because clearly, the Geneva Convention is a starting point, not necessarily the last word, in the sense that uh, uh, the, the be, beyond the, the numerous practical challenges surrounding uh, uh, this issue, there are two main normative ways to develop and retain the centrality of uh, uh, a refugee passport uh, alongside the realities of uh, 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 contemporary refugees. First of all, of course, as a first step, encouraging more ratification of the, uh, of the Refugee Convention, and also a more systematic incorporation of Article 28 in the domestic law. Because clearly, uh, 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 it's true that the Convention is well ratified, but we still have 43 uh, UN uh, member states which did not ratify the Refugee Convention. And many of them are major countries of asylum. So uh, uh, Pakistan is a good example, uh, Lebanon uh, uh, hosting uh, a, a huge number of refugees and so on. So clearly, more ratification, encouraging more ratification is part of the picture. But of course, I mean, ratification is a sovereign decision. So I mean, uh, for the stakeholders can simply encourage, but the last word is to the sovereign state to decide whether or not it will ratify the, the convention. Another way, uh, uh, in parallel to uh, 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 ratification to the refugee convention, another way to uh, uh, bank on the potential of the travel document is uh, 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 what I, I call moving towards an integrated approach of refugee law and human rights law. Uh, this is uh, uh, what I have developed in, uh, in uh, several uh, publications, and, and especially the last one in uh, the Oxford Handbook of International Refugee Law. So this is to acknowledge uh, that human rights law, uh, uh, so the ICCPR in short, and refugee law should be articulated within a comprehensive and coherent framework of analysis. So in order to make sure that they are working in tandem. And here, when you look at this uh, uh, issue from a broader picture, not only the Refugee Convention, but from the angle of the ICCPR, the right to leave uh, and to return, there are uh, 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 two major added, value, uh, added values of human rights law. First of all, 
International human rights law, and in our case, the right to live and to return, is a, a vital source of binding commitment for all uh, state parties, uh, state, uh, non-state parties to the Refugee Convention. Uh, because the fact that a state did not ratify the Refugee Convention does not mean that there is no refugees in the country. So clearly, there is a need also to facilitate uh, uh, the mobility and uh, uh, resettlement of these refugees, even if the country of asylum uh, did not ratify the Refugee Convention. So here, uh, this is a, a vital source of binding commitment, human rights law, uh, uh, for the 43 uh, 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 non-state parties. But even, and this is a second added value, even for state parties, because as mentioned before, all state parties are, to the Refugee Convention have ratified the ICCPR. Even for uh, uh, state parties, there is also uh, 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 an interest in uh, developing this integrated approach. In fact, when uh, I published this uh, chapter and, and previous ones, I didn't add in mind the, the travel document, but uh, 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 the, travel, the refugee travel document perfectly match with this approach. Uh, 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 to give you a, a concrete example uh, before finishing my, my presentation. So here you have the Article 28 of the Refugee Convention. Uh, and in particular, uh, I put in italics, there are the personal scope. Uh, 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 is, uh, there are two different normative propositions. First, a duty. The contracted states shall issue to refugees lawfully staying in that territory. So uh, states, parties are bound to give a travel document, but only to refugees lawfully staying in that territory. Okay, so which means that Refugees without lawful status, or even refugees who are not of yet officially recognized as such uh, asylum seekers, are simply not covered by Article 28. However, the second proposal, this is uh, the second sentence, uh, the contracting states may issue such a document to any other refugee. So this means that there is a duty for refugees uh, lawfully staying, and simply a recommendation, an, inv an invitation to states uh, for uh, all the other refugees, okay? So this is the current state of uh, uh, Article 28 of the Refugee Convention. When this issue is viewed from the angle of refugee law, and in particular ICCPR, the, the picture is, uh, 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 is uh, more dense and uh, interesting in the sense that under uh, uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, so everyone should be free to leave any country. And here, what is interesting is that the, 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 German, the ICCPR has a, a, a key role to supplement the personal scope of the Refugee Convention because uh, it does apply to everyone, uh, which means, and this has been confirmed by the Human Rights Committee it is not restricted to persons lawfully within the territory, and also because the right to live includes uh, uh, the right to obtain the necessary travel documents, which means that when you interpret uh, 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 the ICCPR against the background of refugee protection, for so uh, refugees who, who are not covered by Article 28, because they are not lawfully staying, they are still entitled to travel document under the right to live uh, as acknowledged in the ICCPR. So clearly, this is also important today to acknowledge uh, the, plural the plurality of legal sources, and this can also help to design a, 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 an ancient passport for our century, because what is needed today, it's, it's true that refugees lawfully staying in the territory, they, they have the right to, uh, to travel, but more, more importantly today, we, there is a need to protect those who are not lawfully staying in order to give them uh, opportunities in terms of mobility, in terms of resettlement alongside the refugee compact. So clearly, the refugee uh, uh, travel document is not a relic of the past, it has also the potential to uh, promote uh, 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 
uh, maybe not a new, but at least an integrated approach to refugee protection, uh, uh, combining refugee law as a starting point and human rights law to supplement the limitations inherent to Article uh, 28. And uh, uh, instead of, of regarding refugee law and human rights law as uh, professional silos, uh, this new perspective offers a, a, a broader vision of refugee protection. And uh, because after all, refugee protection is part of the broader international human rights framework, and it stands out as a powerful uh, means to guarantee due respect for human rights. And reciprocally, human rights law upgrades and reinforces refugee law within a, no, a, a normative continuum of protection. So travel document is only one example of many uh, other examples of these uh, uh, mutually reinforcing uh, uh, interface between refugee law uh, and uh, uh, human rights law. Uh, 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 I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, we will continue now to, uh, to discuss, because there are many different things to be discussed about the travel uh, document, and uh, I would like to uh, uh, welcome uh, 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 our speakers for uh, the panel discussion uh, to continue the discussion about uh, the relevance, uh, but also the challenges uh, 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 surrounded the refugee uh, travel document. Uh, please, uh, Madeleine uh, uh, Garlick uh, 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 and uh, Edgelunde, you are welcome uh, to take a, a seat here. So maybe uh, let's uh, start with uh, uh, Madeleine Garlick, uh, who is uh, chief uh, of the protection policy and legal advice uh, uh, at uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, a well-known, I must say, expert in this area. Uh, she uh, is leading UNHCR development uh, and production on uh, interpretation of many different aspects of uh, the Geneva Convention and refugee law. And she was also responsible for uh, a UNHCR liaison to the EU uh, during uh, 10 years. Uh, and she has also served with the UN in uh, many different locations, uh, Iraq, Kenya, uh, Bosnia, and Herzegovina. Uh, so uh, I'm very pleased to have uh, you uh, uh, here today and to share your views about uh, uh, the refugee travel document. Thank you very much, Professor Shatai. And I must say, it's really a pleasure and a privilege to be here uh, today. I think, really, from UNHCR's perspective, this is an extremely timely and important topic. And this is not least because the reality of our work today in the refugee sphere shows us that the question of the movement of refugees across borders after they have been recognised, as well as that of stateless people, remains a very sensitive and controversial issue in many cases. We have a narrative that exists, I think, in some political circles and perceptions that people who have been recognised as refugees, if they move on to other countries, are somehow not really in need of protection. But the reality, of course, as we have heard in Professor Shatai's explanation and uh, that of Professor Goodwin-Gill, is that they have a right to leave and to move on to other countries. And what we see is that in many, many situations, this is actually essential for them to be able to find a durable solution for their displacement and to be able to really fully achieve their potential in many circumstances. We've heard some very interesting insights now from Professors Goodwin Gill and Shatai about the refugee passport for the 21st century and what it should be. I'll say a few things now perhaps about what the reality of a convention travel document is and about some of the continuing challenges that we need to overcome in this work. As many of you know, I think UNHCR, of course, the UN Refugee Agency, carries supervisory responsibility under paragraph 8 of the 1950 statute that established the organisations. Uh, that requires it to supervise the application of refugee instruments, and that, of course, will includes Article 28 relating to the issuance of travel documents. And we also have a mandate with respect to stateless persons under the 1961 Convention relating to the reduction of statelessness. 
And so based on this, we support and advocate with states to encourage them to issue to refugees and stateless persons the travel documents to which they're entitled to enable them really to exercise their related rights in practice. So I want to set out today perhaps three, three things. I'll speak briefly about some of the key principles which underpin the issuance of travel documents, as well as the purposes that they serve in practice. And these will, I think, really underline the extraordinary value they carry for refugees and stateless persons, including as ways to enable them to restart their lives and to find solutions. Secondly, I'll speak a bit about efforts that have been undertaken in recent years to promote the issuance of machine-readable documents, which really have been crucial, I think, in many instances in ensuring that refugees and stateless people remain able to travel effectively in practice, because the reality of modern travel today is that if one is to fly and, and cross many other land and sea borders, one needs documents that do contain the security features that the vast majority of states today demand. I want to then thirdly speak briefly about the picture in practice. How many contracting states are actually complying with their obligations to issue travel documents, but also to refer to the practice of some non-contracting states, which show some very interesting patterns. So first of all, with respect to key purpose, principles and purposes, well, as we've heard very clearly set out by Professor Shatai and Goodwin Gill, a travel document is a right are not only under the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees, but also the African Union Convention, as well as that of the Convention on Stateless Persons. So in addition to advocacy and support to states to help them to fulfil this obligation, UNHCR for many years has issued convention travel document booklets to states which have not had the capacity to produce or to issue them. And we still do this today. The aim, of course, behind this, this furnishing of hard copy booklets, is to ensure that refugees and stateless people are not disadvantaged by the fact that they may be in case living in states that don't have the resources to be able to issue such documents. So we pass these documents to states, but crucially, those states remain responsible for the formal issuance of those documents and, pivotally, to ensuring that they honour the right of those people to return a crucial right, which, as Professor Goodwin-Gill has said, was not associated with all of uh, the Convention Travel Documents predecessors. A second key principle, travel documents enable the exercise of other human rights. We've heard about the right to leave any country, but importantly, in practice, these effectively enable many refugees and stateless people to have access to the right to work, the right to education, to take up study and labour market opportunities where these are available. And this has been a key part of the work around the Global Compact, which is sought to promote access to these so-called complementary pathways, which should mean that a refugee should have a right to take up a scholarship, such as those which Germany has been offering to many refugees in the Middle East, or which Japan is also offering to many refugees. And labour market opportunities, which may exist in parts of the world where labour market shortages exist, also can provide a crucial pathway to solutions for many refugees who may not be able to find the opportunity to work in the first country into which they have arrived. A third key principle is that it's a concrete way to put into action the principle of leaving no one behind, which of course is very frequently mentioned in the context of the agenda for sustainable development. But what does that actually mean? That means also that people who do not have uh, rights recognised by their countries of origin, or indeed a nationality at all, need also to have the right to be able to travel and take advantages of the opportunities that this globalised world offers them. It means access to the principle of family unity in many cases too. Family reunification is absolutely critical to thousands of refugees who find that they are unable to restart their lives in practice until they know that they can have their family living with them in safety and no longer stuck in limbo in countries of asylum or in their countries of origin. In terms of some of the purposes that these serve in practice, they provide concrete alternatives to uh, resorting to irregular and dangerous means of travel which too many refugees and stateless people are forced to resort to. They can also provide a vital component of civil registration and documentation. As was stated earlier, convention travel documents do not per se provide evidence of identity, but they do effectively enable people to get access to many other forms of registration and practice. Let me turn to the work that's being done in recent years to advance access to machine-readable travel documents. In 2015, amendments were made to the 1944 Convention adopted by the International Civil Aviation Organisation. And this now requires 
that convention travel documents issued to refugees and stateless persons should be machine readable. What does this mean in practice? Well, of course, this means indeed that this is going to actually practically enable people to travel. We all know about how ubiquitous machine readable documents are in our lives. Most, if not every one of us in this room, showed a machine readable document when we walked into the room today. Our COVID passes are precisely that. It's evident that without access to electronically stored information and biometrics, it's extremely difficult to function in today's world. And so machine readability is a crucial feature of these travel documents if they're going to mean anything in, in practice for refugees and stateless people's lives. So uh, a further development happened then in 2017 when UNHCR's executive committee adopted a conclusion on machine-readable convention travel documents. UNHCR's executive committee today comprises over 100 states, and very interestingly, a significant number of them are not contracting states to the 1951 convention. And this is a reflection of the reality that some 85% of the world's refugees are in lower and middle income countries and in some regions of the world where there are simply not many states that are parties to the convention. So this XCOM conclusion, which is considered soft law, I should be clear, it's not binding hard law, but it is considered an important source of interpretive guidance to enable states to better understand and apply binding legal instruments. This conclusion was negotiated uh, with a view to giving clear lines forward as to how machine-readable travel documents should be handled. And it contains a number of important elements that I'll touch on briefly. It's on UNHCR's website, and I encourage everybody to look it up if they wish, on conclusion number 114 of 2017. In the first place, it recognises the importance of travel documents for refugees and stateless persons to facilitate their travel, and it underlines the importance of granting visas to holders of these travel documents in recognition of the fact that in and of themselves, the documents do not themselves mean a right to enter on many other states. It underlined the crucial importance of travel documents for the implementation of durable solutions for refugees, including resettlement, but including access to these complementary pathways that have obtained such a prominent place in the Global Compact on Refugees. And this, I should say, was a crucial matter for the states that were in the room. We had very clear expressions of the states negotiating this conclusion, that they did not wish to see refugees simply with the right to move around the world. This should be something that should help bring about concrete solutions for them, rather than adding to the prospect of refugees continuing to look uh, for solutions that they're unable to find. The practice of some states in issuing electronically enabled machine readable convention travel documents with biometric identification capacity was noted. And that conclusion underlined the benefits associated with the increased security features provided by machine readable documents and the importance of secure travel documents in promoting effective traveller identification, reducing the risk of document fraud, alteration and counterfeit, and facilitating global and reciprocal acceptance of travel documents. All crucial priorities of states worldwide, which really adds to the case from our viewpoint uh, that machine readable documents should be a high priority for states in their dealings with refugees. That conclusion also underlined the importance of safeguards to protect personal data, also something that's crucial in today's world. Stress the needs for states and other relevant stakeholders to intensify their efforts to create, expand or facilitate access to durable solutions, making available more resettlement and complementary pathway avenues, and acknowledging the existing good practice of contracting states that already issue machine-readable travel documents, but importantly, also a number of states that are not parties to the 1951 or 1954 conventions. This process brought out very clearly that we have states around the world who, even though they don't accept the Refugee Convention as binding upon them, are nonetheless issuing travel documents to refugees, clearly underlying the practical and day-to-day uh, -day relevance of these documents in many cases. So turning to some of the operational realities we see today. In our 2019 compliance report on CTDs, UNHCR noted that the majority of contracting states, some 78, State, uh, states out of the 149 pa state parties now issue machine-readable convention travel documents to refugees. This rec represents some positive progress, being some 15 more 
states in uh, 2019 than those that were issuing it in 2017. We like to hope that the guidance that ECAO and UNACR jointly issued in 2017 on machine readability in travel documents might have contributed to that. We've also seen some progress with regards to the issuance of documents to stateless people, with a total of some 32 now issuing travel documents to stateless persons. That's an increase of five since 2017. So this is good progress. But the reality is there's still an enormous amount still to go. We have some 38 state parties to the 1951 convention that do not issue any travel documents to refugees, machine readable or otherwise, and some 43 states parties who do not issue any to stateless persons. So overall, UNHCR calculates that only 20% of the world's refugees have access to machine readable convention travel documents in line with ICAO standards. So this for us has to be a crucial priority in terms of future advocacy, pointing out that this can mean not only enormous value for refugees and for stateless persons, but also to states themselves who are better able, therefore, to have access to clear uh, identification capacity and to enhance refugees' access to durable solutions. So we're going to continue our work on this. It's not the most visible part of UNHCR's work, but what we see in practice is this has a cru crucial impact on refugees and stateless people's lives. Amongst the three priorities we'll be working on is continuing to support and press for the transition to machine-readable travel documents. Secondly, we'll also be seeking to promote and enhance international cooperation and responsibility sharing with an emphasis on the need to help provide technology and resources to those states who are not in a position to uh, issue them but also to try to change the narrative about the value and the benefits to the international refugee regime and the statelessness regime generally of allowing free movement and therefore enabling refugees and stateless peoples effectively to exercise their rights. Thank you very much and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Madeleine Garlick, for this very interesting insight on the operational challenges and the concrete reality uh, of uh, travel documents for refugees. Uh, uh, we will continue uh, with, uh, 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 online with uh, Professor Martin Lindbergh-Peterson. Uh, uh, he is uh, Honorary uh, Associate Professor at the University of, uh, Warwick, of Warwick Departments of Politic of Politics and International Studies. He is also the head of Policy and Society at uh, Amnesty International uh, Danish uh, section. And he, uh, he has held uh, uh, several visiting fellowships at uh, the Refugee Study Center at Oxford and in many other places. And uh, we will, uh, I'm very pleased to have you here with us uh, to share your view about uh, the uh, potential of the refugee travel document. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent, and also uh, thank you very much to the other speakers for uh, some really fascinating and uh, timely interventions. Uh, my task here is to uh, temper the expectations uh, uh, or perhaps uh, situate and contextualize the, the radical potential that the idea of, uh, of refugee passport and travel documents have in the current political uh, climate. And I'm going to do that by uh, a case in point, which is Danish externalization desires. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to depart, uh, take a point of departure from a recent legislation passed in Denmark in the spring for externalization. It is unprecedented in this manner. I'm going to use it to talk about externalization, but in the context of describing how this legislation has the effect of co-opting some of the protection systems that we have been referring to so far in the discussion. And um, I suppose I will say something about how this leads should lead us to urgent questions of the balance between documentation and surveillance given the political context and the co-optation of protection systems. Let's see if we can make this. So uh, the Danish externalization law was proposed in February and was uh, subsequently passed uh, in the following month after a public consultation where the government chose not to listen to any of the, the critique coming from 
uh, both Danish Refugee Council, Amnesty International, uh, and the UNHCR, to, may, to name a few. The, the externalization law proposes quite drastically to close down all asylum processing on Danish territory and uh, export it to uh, an unnamed territory outside Europe. And more notably, it also uh, suggests that should asylum seekers be granted uh, refugee status through this process, that uh, status will not be exercisable on Danish territory, but in the unnamed third, uh, unnamed non-European country. So, in effect, the legislation also closes down for the reception and integration of refugees on Danish territory. Another point worth noting is that the law really has uh, significant ramifications in terms of the surveillance and incarceration of asylum seekers. So uh, although it is sometimes or understood as exporting control, it is actually a doubling up of uh, control because there has to be a deportation machine between the Danish asylum system, now void of content, and the, uh, the um, non-European state to where asylum seekers are to be transferred, which is the term used in the Danish legislation. Uh, um, yes, so I move on here. Uh, just briefly understanding what do we mean with externalization, I can define it here as practices whereby actors complement policies to control migration across their territorial boundaries, with initiatives for extraterritorial control and or through other public or private agencies than their own. This is a wide definition and it is meant to also capture uh, certain humanitarian interventions and, uh, and also privatized uh, migration control or by NGO actors should states so uh, choose to strategize. Now, uh, in Denmark, the, the Danish government's claim around this policy was that it's an innovative fix for a broken Danish European asylum system. So it is going in a quite opposite direction than refugee passports or, tra or travel documents, safe legal flight routes in simply uh, relocating the, the entire asylum system and its functionality outside Denmark. Uh, it's claimed to be humanitarian, uh, says the government, since it disrupts the deadly Mediterranean smuggle networks. It argues it will deter asylum seekers from ever coming to Denmark. And then it also argues that new technologies will solve the political problems and stalemates, referencing in particular also biometrics here. Of course, the problems include a thoroughly ahistoric approach. Uh, to externalization, which is by no means a new policy. It has pedigrees back to the uh, 1980s, but I would argue we should also go further back. I would even argue that uh, in uh, cases like Sierra Leone or Liberia during the, uh, uh, the transatlantic slave trade was also cases of externalization of humanitarian responsibility outside, uh, in this case, the United Kingdom or the US territory. Of obviously, another problem with this proposal has been that they, they cannot find a host country, which is why it's a strange, strangely void in the Danish legislation and is why the law potentially could lie in a, in a political drawer for years before being realized. It is actually, uh, in that sense, quite infeasible because a lot of countries and the African Union has explicitly uh, denied any affiliation with the Danish policy, which also indicates that it is for domestic purposes, perhaps, indeed. Uh, and then also what I call bad faith humanitarianism. Denmark has signed the Global Compact, as have many other countries, yet the policies and the legislation passed in Denmark are blatantly in opposition and contradiction to the pledges that we've heard Bansan sketch here. Uh, I'm going to basically just focus on the last part of this slide. The lacking realism of the proposal and the, the immense problems in translating a domestic, domestic election campaign into a uh, a seemingly workable uh, international policy is illustrated by the way that the Danish Social Democratic government has referred to this externalization policy. And it has ranged from talking about enormous refugee cities with schools, universities, 
uh, hospitals to asylum camps, then reception centers, and earlier this year, it was downscaled to experimental mini centers, which may or may not happen. So the uh, ambition and the scope of it has certainly been uh, downscaled. But I think it tells a, a deeply troubling story that we, we need to uh, gather some learning from. The Danish government is trading on, as are many other governments, saying that an asylum system is broken. But the ana analysis behind this, uh, this diagnosis is incomplete, uh, primarily because the Danish state removes itself from the equation. It removes its own obstruction and hollowing out of protection systems from the causes challenging the protection system. Also, uh, I would argue that this way of uh, using the Danish asylum system to deter migration is in fact going to incentivize and, and increase irregular migration. It's going to tell people it is not worth it to go through the Danish protection system. You better work it out on your own, which is exactly leading to the loss of control that the Danish government so fears. Also, it will incentivize a sort of data craving about those displaced. Where are they coming from? Are they en route to Denmark? It is a rise of a certain industry, uh, for instance, producing biometrics and data valence that we are seeing very actively also at the EU level, where we have databases like the Visa Information System, Schengen Information System, Entry Exit System, and the plans for a common identity repository, which is to hold 200 million uh, migrants' uh, biometric information. All of these databases are also geared increasingly for return, which is again back to this point that a protection system currently seems to be being reconfigured towards, uh, towards a deterrence and return system. And, uh, and I think that is something we really have to take, a, take into account when we're discussing how we can uh, counter this development. Thank you very much. Thank you, very, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, telling uh, politics of the Danish government uh, in uh, blatant contradiction with uh, uh, its abiding duties under the Refugee Convention and EU law. We will continue uh, uh, with uh, uh, Elche Lunde, uh, Executive Director of the International Cities of Refugee Network. Uh, he was uh, previously the director of uh, Stavanger International uh, Festival of Literature and Freedom of Speech, and then uh, among the main figures beyond establishing uh, ICON, International Cities of Refugee Network, and he was the first uh, executive director. Uh, you have the floor to uh, present uh, what is uh, ICON and your view about uh, the relevance of travel documents. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for um, um, in, inviting me to take part in this conference. With ICON, we are coming in a little bit from the side here because we are not a proper refugee organization, but we are um, focusing on how what role can cities play in today's world with regard to offering um, uh, complementary pathways to uh, people that are not safe in their own countries. So, so this is, is a little bit from the side, but I think, and we think, and I think the organizers also think that this can be a very, uh, I mean, a complementary and, and, and a, a good also view on the whole picture here. Uh, this is a list of the member cities of ICON. I'm, I'm, we can see here that there's, uh, on, on B, you can see Bern, the Swiss city, but we lack, uh, if you see on G, we lack Geneva. If you see on um, L, we still lack Lausanne, and uh, we see on Z, we lack Zurich. So we do hope also by coming here and speaking to you and, and in, in the context of, of this uh, conference in Geneva, we really hope that there also we'll also be able to, to invite new cities to join. So what, what's ICON about? The very, very, very short, brief, the, the vision and the mission. I mean, th this is... Uh, uh, we're speaking about Article 28, but the Article 19 in, of the uh, Human Rights Convention is, uh, imp is uh, about freedom of expression. So ICON is about improved conditions for freedom of expression worldwide. And how does ICON work for that? 
ICON enables cities around the world to provide safe havens for persecuted writers and artists working together to advance freedom of expression, defend democratic values, and promote international solidarity. So this is another view of the network. We see the more cities we can have, we can that can join the network, the more the better is the chance for us to bring persecuted writers, artists, journalists into safe havens. Uh, <clears throat> so we we. Um, we spoke about we, we one on, on the on the wish list for our organization. I'm, I'm being very brief now, but on the wish list for our organization, we have had two wishes that is coming up if we are, uh, are gaining a lot of resources. The first of them is to have an icon helicopter that can fly to Afghanistan, China, or wherever the rats and nuts are persecuted and bring them into a city of refuge. The other dream that we have had is to have um, an icon passport so so that the the persecuted writers, artists, journalists that we are kind of, and, and the cities are working for inviting, that, that, <clears throat> that they can, we can get them into this city as soon, as fast as is possible, because uh, of course, as with refugees, I mean, all these people are in imminent danger, wherever they are, so, so we were hoping for, and, and, and this uh, also was the, the very... Um, kind of intriguing idea also for me also to take part in this conference to see, uh, I mean, we have the, the our office in, in Stavanger in Norway, the country of Fritz of Nansen, and so far we only have the Icon passport as a notebook, so uh, it's, I, I'm, I'm writing my note into it, but hopefully we can arrive at a place and, and sometimes that we can have a, a passport, or at least to, to have a, a better ways to get the, the persecuted uh, people that we work for into the cities here. Uh, let me. So the, one of the members uh, of ICON is um, Paris. So I think that that's one only, especially one uh, thing that I will emphasize with, with her statement here. It's, be, it's uh, towards the end, being a part of ICON hosting writers, journalists and artists at risk is both a very concrete and a very important symboli symbolic fulfillment of our commitment. What we ask our uh, member cities to do is mainly to protect one refugee or one persecuted writer, one persecuted artist, maybe also with uh, both with family and some cities take two. And, and now uh, with the Afghanistan crisis, there are also there are many cities that are now are offering or, or trying to see solutions where they can also, f at least on a temporary basis, also take uh, take some more. But 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 also this. Um, Symbolic fulfillment, some symbolic dimension is very important. When a city takes a step and joins this movement, they also saying something uh, very important. We want to be a solidaric city. We want to be a hospitable city. We want uh, to be an inclusive and welcoming city. And and that's uh, I think is very important in today's world. The, the, um, the predecessor icon, uh, the whole movement was started by the International Parliament of Writers in the 90s. Jacques Derrida, the philosopher, was a part of, was, was very central in, in starting the whole net, the whole movement together with Salman Rushdie and those. So what, what, when <clears throat> I'm just bringing in here what he, uh, his, uh, one of the basic questions that he asked, could a city equipped with new rights and greater sovereignty, open up new horizons of possibility, previous undreamt of, undreamt of by international state law. And uh, to, to accept some of the answers, we would have to re-evaluate the respective roles of states, unions, federations, or state federations on one hand, and cities on the other. And another other try of an answer that he provides himself, if the name had an identity of a city still has a meaning. Could it, when dealing with questions of hospitality and refuge, elevate itself above nation states or at least free itself from them in order to be a free city? I think when we are listening to our colleague from Denmark, I think there we, we can imagine also that, that, that there's an increasing need in countries, even in Europe and even in Scandinavia, for the cities to step up when the nation states are, and the political political climate is like it has been, and, and, and what 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 our friend told about about Denmark. Just uh, finally, Icon has four member cities in in Poland. Uh, the first one was Krakow, then came Wroclaw, and then Gdansk, and also Katowice. 
So this is uh, Mayor Pavel Adamovic signing in to ICON in, in 2017. And, and what, what is very clear for the cities in, um, in Poland joining ICON is that they are joining this movement, um, <clears throat> inviting and hosting, protecting and promoting persecuted rights and artists to show a sign that we want to do, we want to be an open city, an inclusive city. We want a society not, uh, we, we do not share the dream of the, the government to, to, to kind of to close the country in or to, to be uh, as restrictive as possible. We, we as a city, the city of Gdansk, Krakow, Katowice, uh, the, we want open cities, inclusive cities, and we, I mean, we, there's a lot of, of, of um, proof that these cities, they want, if possible, to invite a lot more refugees to Poland or to their city than, uh, <clears throat> it, than, than they have, have been allowed to. So, so these cities are in, in a constant Dialogue, we can say it to put it very mildly, but also in many times in a fight with the government against, I mean, LGBTI is one thing that the, the city of Krakow, when they should invite their guests, they persecuted right that last time, they insisted of, on, in inviting an LGBTI um, person. And, and they, I mean, there's a, a female poet from Angola now, very, very clear, clearly uh, conscious LGBTI person. And, and this, Krakow wanted to do that to, in opposition to all the measures in some measures in Poland to create uh, a LBTI free zone. So, so I'm I'm I'm, con I'm concluding this first just um, uh, uh, brief presentation with uh, Mayor Pavel Adamowicz, who, who who welcomed um, who brought his his city into Icon and and the, the continue we, we see it. I think for us Poland has a very important and the Polish cities has a very important message. So thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much. I have the pleasure now to, to give the floor to Max Mam Mamou, a, a lawyer, French lawyer and president of the Fondation Mémoire Albert Cohen for the concluding remarks of this uh, conference. And I will try to, you know, uh, uh, keep an eye on my notes and to make it short. And you are all invited to the cocktail after, afterward, OK? <laughs> this is the deal. Thank you. Um, we really wanted to. Um, um, mark the 70th uh, anniversary of the convention. It all started with an idea in uh, 2007, the year the late Miriam Champigny, Albert Cohen's daughter, and Gérard Valbert, his friend and biographer, created the Memoir Albert Cohen Foundation in order to perpetuate his uh, huge legacy. Let's spare a thought for them tonight. Before closing this session, I would obviously like to start by thanking the institution that welcomed us, Mr. Vincent Chetai, with whom we created tonight's program. Our speaker, both here in the room and elsewhere online in the wide world, who gave this conference its international dimension, a necessary step to examine the history and consider the future of the Geneva Convention and of its famous passport. All our volunteers in Geneva, Paris, Corfu, and London. On behalf of our foundation, I wish to thank you all many times over. The 70th anniversary of the convention coincides with the 75th anniversary of the London Agreement. Therefore, it was the perfect occasion to focus on the issue discussed tonight. Albert Cohen, as director of the Protection Division, had the following words uh, during his presentation to the International Organization for the Refugees Conference in 1949. If there is one human being who needs protection, it is truly the refugee. We are not a state, but everything that we can do, we shall do. He also used to quote the following proverb, allegedly Russian, a person is built with three things, a body, a soul, and a passport. These two quotes allow us to grasp the political and deeply humanist vision that Cohen, and before him, Nansen, used to share. But why this travel document is essential during these troubled times, especially since the worst might still be yet to come? In short, the vision is the following. It is absolutely necessary to acknowledge that every refugee 
has the right to own not only ID documents, but also a document that allows him to travel freely. This concept was created a century ago, and yet it is up to our generation to guarantee the effectiveness of this right and the prerogatives that go with it more than ever before. You most likely know that our foundation doesn't aim to claim rights that don't exist. That is why our foundation works to ensure that the existing rights are scrupulously applied. At the same time, we also want the existing right of the refugee freedom of movement to become a fundamental right. We are convinced, as the UNPD has been since uh, 2009, that the fundamental nature of this right will offer more legal security for the countries that host them, whether temporarily or permanently. Consequently, our foundation proposed to explore new approaches to guarantee the effectiveness of the enforceability of this right. Let us recall the three obstacles every refugee faces when wishing to cross a border. One, being recognized as a refugee. Two, having a travel document, a passport. Three, getting the necessary visa for the country he wants to go to. Why must this prerogative be effective? Because without it, refugees cannot find a job, study, or think about a resettlement project without facing unjustified administrative hindrances that could jeopardize their life projects. In the spirit of the Geneva Convention, we will work to match the right acknowledged by Article 28 with an enforceable right to mobility. This right to mobility needs to be as large as possible and must last not only during the validity period of the title, but even longer, as long as the situation of the refugees justifies it. We obviously have big goals in mind. Among those are the universal adoption of the 1951 Geneva Convention and of the 1967 Protocol, and the multiplication of the signature of bilateral and multilateral agreements on the sharing of responsibility favorable towards re the refugees. These objectives may seem out of our reach. Nevertheless, we must find a way to reach them. In order to achieve those goals, the Foundation is currently working on the creation of a network of voluntary experts, Amiki Curier. This Amiki Curier, already trained or to be trained, will contribute in their own country or region to reduction of the divergences of interpretation of the Convention and to the standardization of the practices of the countries or group of countries. By referring to the Supreme Court and the administration responsible for the refugees' freedom of movement, they will watch over the effective execution of Article 28 prerogatives. In addition, our Amiki Curier will also be acknowledged expert and could firstly create a widespread knowledge of the existing international legal standards, they will be able to assist the refugees or NGOs on their side to help them receive or renew or extend their travel document. They will make sure that there are no abusive restrictions on the length of validity or on the possible destination or even on the length of validity to the right to be readmitted. Secondly, they could ensure the full respect of the equality of treatment between nationals and refugees for the obtention of biometric passport and visas. Thirdly, they could propose advisory mission during negotiation of bilateral or multilateral agreements to minimize legal uncertainty. That is, why it's, that is why tonight we are asking for your talents. If you are a lawyer, a lawyer, a magistrate, a retired civil servant, an academic or an NGO legal expert, please contact us through our website. We do, not, we do need your, your skills and your help. We should be able, in, in a medium term, to provide you with an app, allowing you to access in real time the most reliable information about the state of the law and the practices concerning Article 28. Here is, in few words, the ambition that pushes us forward. We will inform you of our progress during the next Biennale 28. Once again, on behalf of the Memoir Albert Cohen Foundation, we thank you for your presence and your attention. The session is closed and you are invited to the cocktail. Building five. Thank you. <laughs>